This episode of Tricky Animals is brought to you by Loot Crate, a bunch of stuff you do not need that'll wind up at the bottom of the ocean. Use promo code ANIMALS20 to get absolutely fucking nothing. How did you not say that it was brought to you by Slowcoin? Because, uh... That's a huge missed opportunity. Because Slowcoin doesn't invest in products like Loot Crate. <laughs> it only invests in the finer things. Also, this is not sponsored by Loot Crate. Don't sue us. You're absolutely right. This is brought to you by Squarespace. Stop for it. the best platform. <laughs> We don't have a sponsor. Hello, welcome to Tricky Animals, sponsored by no one yet. Sponsored by Slowcoin. <laughs> Just forget everything you heard. Slowcoin. Uh, <laughs> That's our new tagline. I am Jenna Lynn Wright. And with you, as always, is Carl. Slominski. We don't have to tell them my last name. Yeah. Okay. If they don't know it, listen, there are like four famous Carls, and I'm one of them. Four? Carl Marx, Carl Winslow, and... Carl Urban. I don't think he's on anyone's radar. He's on my radar. That was Jenna Lynn Wright admitting that she fawns over country singers from Australia. No, Carl Urban. Oh, I was thinking Keith Urban. <sighs> Carl Dread Urban. Is his middle name really Dread? No. Like the porn star, Dread? I wouldn't know. He's a big one. As pure as the driven snow. That's actually not too far <laughs> from the truth. There's quite literally nothing offensive about Jenna Lynn Wright. Okay, veering back onto the tracks. No, no, no. I think, I think we, we've already established that I'm very good at distracting people. I think people. we've already lost half our audience. <laughs> All two of you and my mom can just remember. They'll keep listening just to stay in favor. 2023, the year of not being self-deprecating. Eh. Meh. Staying on the tracks. Uh, we're going to talk about comics and film today. Specifically, uh, SDCC. San Diego Comic-Con. I got lost in my acronym there for a second. (laughs) SDCC. And we're going to talk a little bit about the strike, uh, the WGA, uh, SAG. Do you really have to to run down what you're talking about, your talking points? Yes, it's what's called a podcast. Now, podcasts have better... We're going to turn into one of those generic media podcasts where they're just like shilling for movies that nobody goes to see and talking about Hollywood gossip and slowly but surely... Are you trying to get people to turn us off? Yes. (laughs) I, is it better to fade out than to disappear? What is the phrase? The, the... Burn out than to fade away, Jack yeah. Black style. I have burned out and we are fading away. Fair enough. Uh, yeah. So how was your Comic-Con? I didn't go because I wasn't invited, but next year. Next year's my year. Well, here's the fun fact. If you were invited, you would have had to have canceled your appearance in sure. solidarity with the fine folks on the picket line. Yeah. But here's the thing that's been entertaining to me. We thought, we thought, oh shit, all big media is pulling out. Yeah. No TV, no movies, and the general public consensus was like, what? Actors. I think some directors had to show up, right? Uh, if they did, they're scabs. No, they're not, because DGA signed a contract. Nah, they're scabs. <laughs> Solidarity. Uh, and I was hopeful, Yeah. which was my first mistake, because uh, okay. they were all like, hey, you know, with all the lack of media, it's going to go right back to what, it's, what it was founded on. Comics. And how many tables of comics did we see? None. And uh, how many familiar creators did you see signing at booths other than, you know, big booths? I don't know. I know Ben Templesmith was there. Yeah, well, just because you know someone. Well, he's dope. He is. Um, but yeah, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't a huge, there wasn't the comics presence, the resurgence of comics that we thought there would be. Uh, it was very subdued and I don't want to say disappointing, but like... San Diego Comic Con has been disappointing for me. It wasn't the comic explosion you wanted it to be. Well, I think also this is kind of a two prong thing that nobody's really discussing, and that's uh, San Diego Comic Con first kind of came back in full swing last year, yeah. post pandemic, and the pandemic obviously made it difficult for shows and performers to make appearances. Sure. And the big news article was like, "Hey, there are actually comics and comics media here more," and then the writer strike happened and the actor's strike happened in quick succession and it became very apparent that like this is another year where you could pivot back to comics and instead it just kind of became Funko dumping ground. Well do you think that's because I mean DC and Marvel both showed up right? I believe so. I mean like they always have a presence but it's not the presence that you want. But do you think that it was still subdued because when it comes right down to it unfortunately the the properties that people care about from DC and Marvel are 
the characters that have been made into movies, not the actual comic books they're based on. Oh, nobody who likes those movies likes comics to begin with. Almost so, nobody. Yeah, there's like a, a very strong contingent of like MCU people that are uh, Target customers. Sure. Not to denigrate Target customers, we're a Walmart family. But it's it's hey, very I love Target. it's interesting to me just how few of those people. I remember reading uh, on a on a subreddit, a comic subreddit about a kid who was getting made fun of for reading Marvel comics by a bunch of kids who were wearing Marvel shirts. Sure. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds about right. Um, and I do feel like that kind of speaks to the whole strange debacle of the separation of church and state comics versus the <laughs> medium that... Uh, like, it, you could have known. a booth full of Marvel comics or a booth full of DC comics, but do you think that the average film goer or average um, citizen is going to really swing by and be like, I want to get this run of Daredevil, or I want to get this run of Blue Beetle. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah, if anyone's clamoring for Blue Beetle, I mean, that's a very specific fan. Sure, and that's great. I just... All 12 of you. I think But it's... then again, who was a huge fan of Guardians of the Galaxy before James Gunn got a hold of it and kind of, you know, dropped the bomb on everybody? Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of retconning with the gun, the gun, the gun universe. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even going to bother with that one. But I mean, you, you can't deny that like that was kind of a property that no one was paying attention to. And he clearly had a, an affinity for. And then he came in and created a world or co-created a world, you know, based on these books that got people really interested and had, you know, now people are walking around with baby Groots on their t-shirts. Oh, you can't go anywhere without a baby Groot. Baby Yodas, baby Groots. I'm just saying, like, just take characters and make them babies. Maybe some Porgs, but... If they really want to make some damn money, they'll just skip making X-Men movies altogether and just go straight to the X-Babies. There's an X-Babies? Yeah, there's an X-Babies. That's actually in the comics. Hard pass. It's gonna happen. I'm telling you right now. So yeah, I, all I want to say is, like, now you have a legion of... of Guardians of the Galaxy fans who, do you really think any of them... I was waiting them... for you to say a legion of superheroes. No. Do you th how many of them do you think have picked up a Guardians of the Galaxy comic book prior to, like, of any sort of run prior to the movie coming out? Uh, like, did, who picked up Guardians of the Galaxy circa 2005 to, to read it after they watched the movie? Did the movie come out in 2005? I, no, what I'm saying is, like, who went back prior to 2016 or whenever it came out to say, oh, I want to read this this run from I don't know. I, I'm fairly certain I stopped reading comics in general at that point, especially from the big two. I know that they put, like, big-name creators on the books. Sure. Then, like, I think Bendis was writing it for a hot minute. Yeah. Like, around the time of the first movie. It's neither here nor there. I think the point I was trying to get to was the fact that the rate of returns on DC films specifically right now... Which I like DC. Yeah, but have they made a movie that you've enjoyed yet? Yes. What? I liked Wonder Woman. She has to say that. She's a girl. I liked Wonder Woman, period. Did you... By period, do you mean the period of the 80s in 1984? I didn't love not Wonder Woman 1984. Did anyone? Uh, I don't think so. I'm pretty sure that that like, was taking 20 years backwards for feminism. But I listen, I didn't mind uh, the Justice League actual cut. Oh, the Snyder Cut? Yeah, like, listen, the fanboy blah, 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 you want. The, the, the actual Snyder Cut was way better than the cut that the studio released in sure. the theaters. I'm, the bar was set pretty fucking low, but yeah. Um, yeah, I've But, like, that. honestly... Like, I love Batman. I liked the Batman. I mean, those are all DC people. I feel like Batman should stand on its own. Like, it's DCU and then Batman. Because I don't feel like... I feel like you get a different audience with just Batman. Fair. I think people... People like Batman. The idea mm -hmm. of Batman. Ah, uh, Batman. And then everything else is just kind of like, if you try to convince people that The Flash is cool by putting Batman in your Flash movie, that's where you're getting those numbers for The Flash. Because that Flash movie was mid at best. I don't know. Didn't you like it more than you thought you would? First act was fine. Yeah. Um, and I loved seeing Keaton, of course. But it wasn't like, I didn't love seeing him because I was like, oh, Oh, you know, 1980s Batman. Hard, I like seeing him berries. because he's great. Michael Keaton is great. Yeah. And he's great in that role. Um, I didn't need him to say, let's get nuts, for me to like him in that role, in I, that movie. I did. Fair enough. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think that we're at a very interesting point because pop culturally, 
the stuff that used to be in high demand is no longer in high demand. Marvel burnout, right? Superhero no, fatigue. Not even superhero fatigue. I think like tentpole fatigue in general because sure. nobody wants a damn Star Wars movie. Nobody gave a shit about Indiana Jones. Those Jurassic Park movies are just ridiculous. We're on our, what, 30th Fast and the Furious movie? I don't know. I, st- I stopped. I, I'm I kinda, not caught up. I kind of feel like the only franchise that's actually doing decent, and that's not a big thing right now. Fast is and the Furious is doing really great. Right. I wasn't saying it wasn't doing well. I just think people, it's like a punchline now. Mm. Um, Mission Impossible is doing fine. Yeah, I don't think it opened to the numbers they wanted it to, but I mean, like... I think that's a that's a big time. We're franchise. we're very much in the middle of a turning point, though. Sure. Where I think that, especially now that everything's up in the air with the strike, a smart executive, which is an oxymoron, would look at the receipts and say, maybe we should pivot from this. Well, because either, listen, the only thing that does consistently, reliably well, is the. I don't even want to say low budget. I want to say lower budget. Under five, under seven point five million dollars. Right, commercials. Horror movie. No horror <laughs> movie. Yeah, I like horror I, always makes bank. Nobody's gonna disagree on that one. Or at least the majority of the time. And I think it's getting way too risky to continue only making low budget horror or two hundred million dollar explosion extravaganzas. Uh, I think so. The return of the mid budget movie. Uh, I'm all for it. You know me. I uh, I like mid-budget movies, especially if they're not based on any IP. It makes me sad to think that even if there is a return to the mid-budget movie, I don't think that we will ever get a return to the people flocking to the theaters to see like a $40 million rom-com. I feel like rom-coms are now relegated to streamers almost exclusively. Uh, Yeah, because we're running out of movie stars. Well, I don't even know if it's that. I think it's that over the last 20 years, you have been told over and over, it's been crammed down people's throats, you have to go see this in the theater because it's a spectacle, and rom-coms are never a spectacle. So why am I going to spend my money on it and go you know, spend $50 to go to the movies to go watch something I could comfortably watch on my couch that has no flashbang explosions or like huge CGI set pieces? I mean, I love mid-budget rom-coms. I would gladly go to the theater for it, but I don't know that that there's a, a market for that anymore. I was trying to think if I had actually seen any rom-coms in the theater, and I think I had seen a couple, but they were like at the discount theater, like the last sure. run, whatever. I don't remember which ones. Yeah, well, it was probably so long ago. Yeah, uh, I'm sure I saw like an Apatow movie in theaters. Yeah. But yeah, I generally speaking, I, I don't... I, I don't know. I think the, the streamer, you're absolutely right. I also feel like that's a good place for them. Because at the end of the day, that's comfort food. As and long people, as those streamers are going to pay. Well, I'm not going to get into any of that. <laughs> well, we were going to. Were we? A Was little. that on your list? I mean, that's the strike. That's kind of the strike stuff. I, read deadline. No. <laughs> Whatever. I uh, I think that... It, what it comes down to is we're at this, this turning point where things could either go really, really cool if there was a little bit of vision and a little bit of forethought about the future, or things can be even worse. Things are worse than ever, to quote one of my favorite uh, Batman n- narrative cops. Yeah. I, um, I think that it's been shown, or at least is being shown over and over right now, that things are going to get worse. Okay. Because no one's coming back to the table to make a deal that's fair. They're only interested in, like, what people are talking about how now that nobody's buying anything because they can't buy anything, you know, these um, studios or streamers are now, like, kind of cash rich because they're not spending money to buy any projects. But it's such a short term uh, line of thinking because your pipeline's going to dry up, you know? And so you have a little bit more cash now. It's, uh, it's cutting off your nose to spite your face. Like, spend the money now to make sure that you are treating people... They don't care about treating people fairly, but <laughs> to make sure that you have content, for lack of a better word, to put out in the next in the coming years, and it's, it's not happening. Stocks. I had nothing to add to that. Like, no, literally... I couldn't tell by the deafening silence. I, I just... It's one of those things where I'm like, listen... 
Yeah. Neither of us are in the WGA, and we're clearly not actors, although very talented on mic. But I just, it's, I'm lesser uh, qualified to try to run analytics on big business. Oh, I'm just reading this from an overhead, reading the trades point of view. I'm not in the weeds by any means. I just... I know there's a strike. I know that writers should be getting paid fairly, and so should actors, and let's not AI people out of jobs, but... Yeah, I'm not. I'm not at the WGA meetings, and I'm not getting the emails. Listen, nobody asked my permission. <laughs> yeah. They didn't run this by me. No, I know. I had plans. Uh, and you still do. Um. So what do you what do you think? You think because you're all doom and gloom now? You're no, I'm not doom and gloom. You're basically saying it's going to get worse. What do you think the landscape's going to look like in this desolate wasteland post cybernet? I I I think that uh, eventually. There will come a grudging deal. Neither side is going to get exactly what they want. I hope there are protections for AI. I hope that there are writers' rooms. I hope that people get the staff and the time to make quality uh, art and not just content that people think the uneducated consumer will, as is in the name, consume because there's really nothing else for them to do. I hope that people seek out well-made things and that they understand that people do care about what they make and not everything is just some soulless cash grab or something someone shit out because they could make $100,000. So, okay, let me let me stop you there because that's an interesting point. You're talking about the consumer. Yeah. And the assumption that people want quality shit. If you go on any comments board, which is the worst thing you can possibly do. Yeah, I don't know why I would ever do that to myself. About any article regarding, like, see, tentpole filmmaking, where mm-hmm. all the money for these studios comes from, nearly 85, I'll even say 90% of them is like, oh, I'm so fucking sick of these cheap Hollywood reboots, remakes, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, then stop fucking going. Yeah, well, how many of those people are then going to see... Like that's my point. Like yeah, a twenty four movies or movies that are well regarded on the festival circuit and and have like a limited theatrical run. Like no one's they're not going to see them. So to my point though, I think that when your choices are either popcorn munching spectacular or the fucking Northman, like your average consumer isn't going to get stimulated. St- Stimulated. They want. They want something to hold on. I have a. a yeah, I'm getting I'm this. not going to say anything. They're going for that experience, that escapism. And as we were saying before, if there is a return to mid-budget filmmaking, they can have that, but also not have to feed the machine. Well, I think that that's what's been gutted. I think it's either quote unquote mindless, huge budget extravaganzas, or tiny art house films that people there is no middle ground just entertainment sure it could have a message but like going to the movies just to have some fun and I don't and I don't mean that in a turn off your brain kind of way I mean you can still think about what you're you're watching and and engage with it in a cerebral way but like what happened to I mean you always see those those memes posted of like the um theatrical uh, what is it with the light boards? Uh, why can't I think of the name? Not billboards, but like in front of theaters. Like a light bright? Yeah, where you see all the names. You mean the marquee? Movies. Yeah, the marquee. The marquee. And you'll see like, oh, it's 1983 and fucking the thing. And it's, it's but it's like, back to the future part, blah, blah. And it's like all of these different types of genres and it's all quality films. And it's like, there was something for everyone. And now it's either you're going to watch a $300 million movie where 90% of it is not in re- the real world or something that someone made for two nickels and a couple of paper clips that's playing at like the tiniest indie theater on either coast and there's really like that's why I hope there's a return of the mid-budget movie where it's like there's a sci-fi out and there's a horror out and there's a drama out and there's a you know a comedy out and it's just like there's a variety of choice rather than you have to watch one of two things, otherwise stay home and surf Netflix for three hours until you give up and go to bed. That's the majority of the time that I spend on streamers. Yes, of course it is, because there's so much to wade through. So is this an abundance of riches? I'd say it's an abundance. I don't know if it's of riches. I think that there are gems. I think that there are 
uh, I mean, like, I don't think that we ever would have found bliss without Shudder. Mm. Um, there have been plenty of, of cute uh, rom-coms we've seen on things like Prime. Like, what was that one with Charlie Day and Jenny Slate? Don't remember the name, but I remember the movie. Which re- I really liked it. Like, there have been plenty of things that we've discovered because of streaming that I don't think we would have seen otherwise. But, like, the vast majority of what you... The, the sheer effort it takes to wade through what's out there because it's not necessarily curated. It's just, like, we have to feed the monster is a little bit disheartening. Mm. And it was a, a glut for a long time. Like, I feel like it was good for people. I'm selling this, I'm selling this, I'm going over here. There are so many options, but, like, it can't always expand. It's going to contract, and now it's starting to, and everyone's realizing, hey, maybe that wasn't as great as we thought it was. Do you think it's starting to contract now, or it had been contracting prior to all this? Because, it had been contracting. like you said, there's an abundance. All that stuff was in the pipeline five, ten years prior, essentially. And now we're just, you know... People are going to run out of money eventually. You can't always, it's just not going to go up, 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 up. Yeah. You know, they're already saying, oh, well, the golden age of television is over. Like, what was it? Breaking Bad was 10 years ago, and you had the Game of Thrones, and you had all of this stuff out, and it was like, oh, this golden age of, like, A-list movie stars flocking to television, and now it's like you kind of hear the horror stories about what actually goes on trying to get a television show made, and then residuals, and people not getting paid what they're worth, and it's just like... So it looked glamorous and glossy on the outside, but in the in the trenches, it's just a, a complete slog, and people are just getting completely burned out because they're not getting the resources they need. It's just again, feed the beast, feed the beast. Right. It's very cynical, but like it, that's really what it seems like. Sure. Which is why I keep telling my writing partner, "Let's go make an indie movie by ourselves." Like no one. Here's the thing. Sure, you might not be getting paid by a studio, but if you can scrape together a little bit of cash, no one can stop you from writing. No one can stop you from making a film. Like, that's the one thing that these studios don't seem to understand is, writers going to write. That's what they do. Well, that's why they're hoping they all come back without well, a no, deal. They're like, they're going to come shit. for the... <laughs> People are going to find other outlets. Sure. They're not going to rely on Netflix or Apple or whatever. They're going to be like, you tried to. You told me you wanted me to be homeless. Go fuck yourself. Why are you gonna drag Apple into this? Nobody watches Apple. They watch Ted <laughs> and Lasso. Carl never sold anything to Apple they, again. <laughs> they watch Ted Lasso and they bounce. They tell everyone they know that they will watch Ted Lasso. It's the best show on TV. And then they forget about Ted Lasso for a year. And then it randomly drops another fucking year later. And then people are saying, like, "Yeah, Apple." I'm just saying it. Writers are used to being underpaid. They're used to having multiple jobs to keep the the lights on. They're used to rejection. They're used to being crushed. Like, this is just another day in the life of a writer, and they're going to write regardless. So the studios are going to realize that they, they, don't, they don't have the juice. It's like, what's that line in High Fidelity? If you really wanted to mess me up, you should have gotten to me earlier. <laughs> should have gotten to me earlier. <laughs> it's real writers in 2023 energy right there. Um, so, yeah, I can't speak exquisitely about the strike i'm not involved in it in that very real way and where it's i lost a deal at a studio or i had a show on the air and now you know things have gone sideways but i know that everyone's at a standstill and now everyone's just writing for themselves if at all like some people are taking well-deserved breaks but like writers are going to write regardless of whether or not like no matter how long these studios go and they will always have things for themselves and they'll find a way to make them like, that's just what creatives do. They're scrappy and they create shit and then they make they make that shit real. Mm. I've never waited for anyone to give me permission to do anything. I, I, I wish more people were tenacious like that, though. I feel like once you get into that system of permissions, you kind of lose that spark. Like, that, fuck you, I'll do it anyway. I feel like I waited too long to, to, to think I needed uh, permission. I feel like I always wrote. But in terms of like trying to go the traditional route, I think I definitely hamstrung myself, uh, not just being like, oh, you don't want this thing I wrote? Okay, fine. I'm going to go find a way to make it myself. I should have done that years ago, for sure. Well, you can't live with regrets. Oh, no regrets. See? Not even one letter. What about investments? Do you regret not investing in slow coin? <laughs> and we're back. We're doing record numbers. Oh, yeah? Yeah. How much is one slow coin worth? It's uh, 0.0006 of a cent. Wow. 
Yeah, we're getting up there. I'm really proud of you. Should be. We're still worth more than Twitter. <laughs> no, it's X now. All right. Apparently, I don't know, I'm not on Twitter. Apparently nobody else is. It's X now. They're all on Blue Sky. I'm not on Blue Sky either. I'm on Truth Social. Uh, <laughs> um, sorry, it, took, it was a delayed reaction. It took me a second. Uh, but circling back to our original point, SDCC and comic books. I feel like that's a bit of a stretch. Yeah, that was circling a long back. time ago. Well, you know, apparently you needed a soapbox I today. Can, hey, you're the one chiming in. You're the one who asked me the question. I'm the one going, mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. You had plenty of thoughts about Apple and Ted Lasso. I'm your, yeah, because I think it's hilarious because that's the only show that people watch on Apple. Uh, they watched the morning show, okay? No, they did watch the morning show, and then they gave up on the morning show like anyone with a brain. I did want to bring it back. It, it did turn into a bigger conversation about content and burnout and tent poles. But, like, you're getting movies now. Aside, the Flash aside, things like Blue Beetle... Thinks that there's going to be another Marvel's movie, right? Ugh, yeah. Lady Power Marvel's movie. Um, do you think that studios are caught up in their own momentum where it's like, I don't know if anyone actually wants this, but we have the characters to mine. So we just have to keep going because I'm a, like, it's like sharks. If they, if they stop swimming, they die. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's a momentum. Uh, I think it's more of the snowball that is rolling down the hill and now there's no stopping it and it keeps gathering shit up. So momentum? I think momentum is more of a positive thing. I think mm. you build off of momentum. I think you is crash. Is this careening out of control? Yeah, I think that we're past the point of no return on that too because like... Everybody seemed to agree that the tap out point was Endgame. That was the last Avengers movie, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I tend to agree with that. I was kind of done way before that, but you, as a completionist, you just kind of sure. go, "Yeah, I'm going to keep on watching these fucking awful movies." But they weren't awful. They the, uh, repeat watchability on them has they're they're lesser than I recall. Okay. Um. I think the problem is they planned too much going out because when the goal is no longer the individual film and but more the, and more yes more the overarching experience adding to the universe I think something is lost um that's why a show like Secret Invasion means nothing to someone who liked the comics because you don't have all the cast in there. Like, it's not an Avengers story. It's a story of, like, two, three people. And you're like, it's what's his name? Nick Fury? Yeah. And it's about... What's his name, Nick Fury? Is it about Fury? Skrulls? It's about Skrulls. So, yeah, to the casual observer, they're like, okay, I think I saw a Skrull in a, in a Captain Marvel movie. I don't understand the, the link. I don't understand... I don't understand what I'm doing here. I just know that it's part of the universe and I probably have to watch it, That's right? kind of the whole reason why the latter-day Marvel stuff sucks. And I use the term sucks just to describe, like, there's a disconnect. But they do suck. What the hell do they have to do with anything other than introduce characters that are going to be used for the big event movie? And use nuggets and Easter exactly. eggs. Exactly. Yeah. Like, so much of the movies that came after maybe Infinity War felt like these are the introductions to characters that are going to be integral to the larger arc moving yeah. forward and not their own individual stories. Look at the Doctor Strange movies. The Doctor Strange movies are very interesting because you're telling an origin story, you're setting up a world, what have you, and then it turns into, but really it's only to service this little idea that's going to come into play in this big movie. Well, here's here's the thing. Now that I think it's it, honestly yeah. as well thought out as a long term plan is, yeah. it's short sighted because it isn't fully it isn't fully developing the story that is just that one story. Like a Doctor yeah. Strange movie could be a hundred and ten percent awesome. But when you're writing it's a hamstrung. Doctor Strange, yeah, it's it's kind of cut off at the ankles because it has to serve this greater story. Honestly, that's kind of what suffers with all of the earlier ones, too, only it's less apparent because it's still a smaller universe. Like, those original, uh, what was it, Captain America, Thor, yeah. or whatever, lesser degrees of good in some of those, but they still are their own functioning movie, even though they're all serving a MacGuffin. Right, no, yeah. Um, it's, it's, I think, to have an endgame, pun intended, uh. in mind... I think would have been fine, 
if only you focused on the individual stories. Well, in talking about kind of uh, careening out of control or momentum, let me put it to you this way. Scarlet Witch was introduced in an X-Man movie, right? Her and her brother, Quicksilver? Uh, no, they're introduced at uh, in Avengers Age of Ultron. Yeah, but they're not in any X-Man movie? No, that's separate because the X-Men right. movies are owned by Fox. So right. Quicksilver appears in the Fox Marvel movies. This is also the other thing. Marvel was short-sighted and thinking they were always going to be bankrupt, so they sold their characters. No, I know. So that whole kerfuffle happened. So you have Scarlet Witch, who's in the Avengers movies. Sure. So then you... You're losing everybody that doesn't care about this. No. <laughs> You're the one rambling on about Marvel. It's the only but example I have. Point. Scarlet Witch is in Avengers movies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then they say, okay, she's got a story that we can, we can utilize. So they give her a TV show, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, okay, so you're filling in a little bit of her backstory, a little bit of her world. And it was a really well done show. The okay. WandaVision of it all. But then... They say, oh, WandaVision did well. Let's take the villain in WandaVision and give her her own TV show, which is that Agatha lady. Which who even cares? But that's what I'm trying to say is you start with one thing, and it seems like a good idea to give them an expanded world here, and then that does well. So you're like, oh, well, let me take this spinoff of a spinoff of a spinoff and give them their own show. And it's like, do you need a Secret Invasion movie when you have Nick Fury and all these other movies, and then you also have a Captain Martin? It's like, does everything have to be so like cat's cradle connected i don't think so yeah i hate that it is that way i think listen the first run of marvel movies were super successful and i think as per usual in hollywood the wrong lessons were learned because then everyone else that had a competing studio big budget whatever was like oh connected universes are what we need then you've got DC scrambling to make Justice League. Then you have fucking even the Fast and the Furious movies now, like intertwine, change the timelines. They got characters coming in from all sorts of whatever. They got spinoffs. Same thing started to happen to Star Wars. Mm -hmm. You know, we got Star Wars spinoffs that nobody asked for with varying degrees of good. 101 TV shows with varying degrees of good. And they all tie into this big picture thing now. It's like, no. A, a movie that exists in its own thing I welcome that. I do miss standalone films, for sure. Yeah. You always want to see more of something you enjoy, but at the same time, there's a bitter sweetness to, I got the thing and it was perfect, let's not ruin it. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah, I think at, the, at one point it was a really, really smart idea because it had never been done before. And like I said, the wrong lessons were learned and everybody started copying that. And uh, now movies are dead. So, do we have anything upbeat to say? <laughs> I don't think I don't think it has to be. We yeah, I don't think there's a way to end on a positive note when you're talking about essentially the literal collapse of it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not. Listen, people are always going to make dope shit. Yeah, I think it's just going to get increasingly harder to find that dope shit, and a lot more personal mining will be involved. Sure. I mean, all the stuff that you mentioned that we found on streamers and all that was just from personal digging around. Yeah. And essentially by preferences. I think that the the film-going experience post-strike is going to be a lot like being a high school punk rocker. You're going to start to hate mainstream shit more and more and try to go as far out to the edge of the unknown, obscure bands as possible just because you hate that other thing so much. Yeah, I, I think don't I think I think you're gonna be like, ew, Green Day. No, they're a bunch of sellouts. And be like over here listening to like Operation Ivy, I'm like oh yeah, well nobody knows them now in 2023. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like it's it, it's gonna be a very and it's a very young opinion of a creative output. But I also feel like as a culture we're so unfortunately pre-programmed to be young now. Thanks to you don't have to throw your toys out anymore. Yeah, I think. Smart people are always going to say, ah, I'm a little cynical and I know what that what made that. And then they'll go for the genuine thing in the corner. I think more people that are tired of yeah. the tentpole fatigue are going to start to, you know, beat to the rhythm of that drum instead. That's going to be my, my upbeat, you know, rah, rah cry for the end of the podcast is like, write the weird thing. Write the thing in your brain 
like hopefully it's a little bit commercial too because you want it to be you know uh interesting to more than just you but like and also write it more expensive i think we're really coming out of the time of like oh i just want to get a movie made so i need to write it under three million or under one million like do that if you're going to direct it but if you're going to try to sell it somewhere write it 30 million write it 50 million because guess what your fee is tied to that movie's budget so if you want to make I don't know, enough money to keep your lights on for more than six months, write a more expensive movie and don't let anybody tell you not to. Period. <laughs> Exclamation point. Yeah. So you think movies are dead? No, not at all. Okay. Absolutely not. All right. I think that certain types of movies are going to fall out of favor as people grow I tired of them. I think a lot of types of movies have fallen uh, out of favor. But I think everything goes in cycles and I think that there is an audience for most things. So... I don't think people really need to worry so much about what it is that they're making and whether or not it will fit somewhere. It mm. will fit somewhere. It just depends on, you know, how mainstream you want to go. I'll tell you what I want to come back. You ready? Tell me. And not just relegated to streamers. I want to see in the theater. Erotic thrillers. I do. I think those will do really well in streamers, though, because yeah. people are embarrassed of their sexuality. You're afraid of boning? Go ahead, watch it on a streamer. Nobody can tell that what you're watching. Mm-hmm. Uh... Mid-budget action movies. Sure. You don't need to throw, you know, $600 million at a John Wick. Those things were done perfectly well for no millions. Um, I would like to see The Return of Slashers. Oh, God, I love a slasher. Cheap, fun, make a shit ton of money. And make them practical, please. I would like to see more mid-budget sci-fi. Hell yeah. But not up-my-ass sci-fi. I don't want to see, like, Christopher Nolan rip-offs. I want to see... Interesting ideas, big swings. I don't care if they're misses, I just want big swings. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm fine with rom-coms being on streamers. I have to be honest with you. I think mm -hmm. that's the place for them. I think finding the place for the content ugh, is going to be the name of the game moving forward. Sure. You know, I think that spectacle is always going to be something that we're craving, especially as viewers. Um, but I, I don't think that we've finally gotten to the end of the road where people are like, I only want to watch this at home. And I, I do think we're at the end of the point where it's, it's like huge explosions, uh, wow us anymore. Like the first couple of times you see it. Okay, great. But then when every movie is about the apocalyptic end of the universe, it just, it loses its oomph. Yeah, hasn't the universe ended like 38 times in the last four years? Yeah, and then it comes back. Everything gets retconned. So, so yeah, movies with stakes, and I'm all about mid-budget sci-fi, mid-budget slashers. More slashers, please. Yeah, I could use some slashers. So, yeah, that's all I got. So, yeah, movies are dead. They're not dead. R.I.P. movies. <sighs> Where can they find you? Online. As long as they're still listening. And in, they haven't just been, like, they're like, all right, I'm sick of these, I'm, you know, motherfuckers. You were going to say MFers? I was going to say MFers, and then I was like, you're an adult, you can swear. Oh my God. You're an adult! She is an adult. Uh, you can find me online at slowmotionart.com or on Instagram at Carl Slominski. And you can find me on Instagram, Jenna Lynn Wright with one N. And that's pretty much it, huh? It is pretty much it. So until next time, true believers, this is us telling you to shut up. Make stuff. <laughs>